Welcome to All Things Financial with Jack Driscoll. Welcome back again, everyone, to another edition of All Things Financial. What we're doing is going through a series with a special guest I have on the show, Matt Carl, who's an attorney in Pittsburgh. Matt, thanks again for coming back. Well, thank you, Jack. What I wanted to do, we talked about a number of different issues the last couple of weeks, general estate planning, and also business planning, business succession planning, and business entity planning. Now what I'd like to do is another one of Matt's skills, which is an area that I'm less familiar with, which is the oil and gas industry and the legalities that pertain really to owners and land owners. When we get to the situation in southwestern Pennsylvania, or all of Pennsylvania, Ohio and West Virginia, actually, I guess, mm -hmm. with this Marcellus Shale and the Utica and all those different issues, brings the need to the forefront of, uh-oh, we need an attorney. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, my, I like uh, oil and gas because when I was a kid, I grew up in West Texas. Ah. Okay, and when, when you guys were growing up here in western Pennsylvania, you know, you'd go on field trips to Kennywood. Yeah. I'd, I'd go on a field trip to an oil refinery. <laughs> 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 so we, we, wow. got, we got to learn about oil real early out in West Texas in the Permian Basin. But anyway, uh, when my dad retired from the military, we moved to central Pennsylvania, and it was all coal. Yeah, that's okay. right. Uh, and as I grew as a young attorney, you know, strip mining around here was a big thing. Huge. In the 80s and Huge. the 90s. Yeah. And I got into, you know, the coal business as far as coal leasing and mineral rights. Wow, okay, I didn't all, know that. And what all that meant. You know, well, coal's no longer king in western Pennsylvania right. for any number of reasons. And uh, so I kind of fell asleep with the mineral interest there mm -hmm. in the early 2000s. And then all of a sudden you started hearing people talking about oil and gas leases. Right. And I had done a couple of oil and gas leases, uh, mostly for what they call traditional wells. Which Is it are the, the wells, shallow that we used Shallow to... wells that you drill straight down and, okay. and, you know, you get what you can. Okay. Okay. Um, and they'd give free oil or gas or whatever it was, I guess, for your house. Is that yeah, what the trade-off yeah, was? Yeah, there was, there was a reservation in those leases <laughs> yeah. where people would be able to get their free gas. That's what I thought. Up to yeah. a certain amount of cubic you know, feet per year. Okay. And so those those leases were pretty much form leases. I don't. There was an old legal publisher uh, here in downtown in the Law and Finance Building. That you know, you the the land men and land men are the guys that go out and try to find people interested in in leasing their their oil and gas. Okay. And they would just have them sign up. So all the leases were pretty much the same. Okay. And you got the same one eighth royalty. Okay. It wasn't really negotiable. Okay. The reason that was is, uh, you know, I did read about Colonel Drake. Colonel Drake had the first oil well here in western Pennsylvania, up near Titusville. Huh. So the oil and gas history and the case law surrounding it here in, in Pennsylvania is quite old. Okay. And it was based upon what they call the rule of capture. And that is, hey, if you drill it and you get it first, it's yours, okay? <laughs> so the rule of capture kind of, you know, predominated where we were. Okay. But, you know, all the natural oil and gas, particularly when gasoline prices were so low, you know, oil and gas was uh, not particularly that big of a deal. Right. Um, uh, then all of a sudden... Well, maybe not all of a sudden. I, and I really don't know what started this interest in the horizontal drilling. I know it started in Texas, of course. Uh, and if it didn't, the Texan will tell you it did. <laughs> <laughs> but the, it, what, what, what they do is they start drilling down tr like a traditional well, and then they start bending the, the drill bit at a certain level and they go and they drill horizontally through layers of uh, through layers of shale in this case. Okay. And, it, and it's hard to understand that you know you say, think well how do you get oil out of a rock? Well, these rocks were you know originally uh, carbon-based type plants yeah. that okay. after years of compression and so forth, uh, mm. you know 
deteriorate. Yeah. And when they deteriorate, they give off gas and carbon. Uh, but the, uh, you know, in places where the pressure was so great, you know, that's where you got your hard coal because it cooked it. Ah, okay. And then the soft coal was where the pressure was a little bit less. And then as you move west across Pennsylvania and into Ohio, the pressure was even lesser. So it's more more uh, oil and gas. I see. Okay? I see. So it was never cooked to coal, okay? Mm, yeah. So when they discovered Marcellus was... Uh, recoverable here in northern Pennsylvania, southern Ohio, or southern New York, mm -hmm. uh, southwestern or, or southeastern Ohio, parts of West Virginia, and of course, you know, the big boom was in Washington County. Right, yeah. Uh, these mostly Texas-based producers would come up here, and they would scramble and get all the leases they could. Yeah. Okay, and so that's where we had our oil and gas boom, and, and it it boomed for a significant amount of time. Mm -hmm. South Point was full of these people. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you saw a lot of trucks with Texas on it and a lot of trucks with, from different places. Yeah, a lot of state. Texas plates. Yeah, for a long period of time, who would come up and do the drilling and really helped out the economy. So uh, oil and gas is, is a big deal, but uh, what does it mean to you? Yeah. Yeah, if you own land... Then you're in a situation where you may have, you're not sitting on a gold mine, but you're sitting on maybe uh, something that will produce income uh, for your lifetime and maybe the, the lifetime of your yeah, children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what, what they're discovering now, they thought this horizontal drilling with the fracking, the fracking is when they inject, you know, uh, and blow holes into the strata of the seam whether it be Utica or whether it be Marcellus, and then they pump, a, let's call it a tonic, because they don't they don't want to tell you what's <laughs> in it, but it involves a lot of water. Okay. And that that forces the gas out of the rock and brings it up through the surface. Okay. And when uh, the the price of gasoline was really high, that this was very profitable because these these wells are very expensive to drill. Mm -hmm. So uh, when that came out, people were getting $500 an acre for a signing bonus and maybe getting a one-eighth royalty interest, which they would uh, you know, pay uh, the expenses of marketing the, the gas and mm -hmm. everything from it. But you, know, you found a lot of farmers who didn't have a lot of money now driving new pickup trucks and tractors. Yeah, and yeah. So to them, it was a windfall. Right. Unfortunately, you know, people that think they're getting a windfall don't really value what they truly do have. Yeah. Because it wasn't but a couple of years later that their neighbors were getting anywhere from four to six thousand dollars an acre. Yeah. And getting, you know, maybe eighteen percent royalties with no deductions. Right. So that's why, you know, you have to not just sign on the dotted line when one of these landmen comes with a smile and knocks on your door and mm -hmm. say, hey, I just signed up your neighbor. Would you like to sign up too? Because uh, obviously land, large tracts of land that are next to each other are very appealing yeah. because of the fact that they drill underneath or the strata might be a good strata to go under from that, from that uh, original site. Yeah. So you're running into landowners who gave away their farm, so to speak, if they did not know in advance the real value, potential value of what they had. Well, they gave away their gas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's, here's some situations that you will run across. Okay. A lot of people may already have the traditional well on their property that is producing. Okay. Okay. Those traditional wells under the old standard leases say that you have leased to them the right to take all the oil and gas off your property. Yeah. So whenever uh, you know the producers come in and they take a look and they see an oil and gas lease for a traditional well, they might just buy out the, the producer that's using the uh. traditional well. Because the courts have come in and said, 
hey, if you lease your oil and gas, you leased your oil and gas. You're not getting that premium for your Utica and Marcellus, even though you had no idea that it was there. And neither did they. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe they did. I don't know. Okay. They just didn't think it was economical to get to. Got it. I mean, these geologists Got know it. a lot Got of it. stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, uh, the, the bottom line, those people were kind of in a jam. Sometimes a good producer would you know, amend their leases because once uh -huh. they get these things all put together, they like to sell them, you know, and okay. market them on a secondary yeah. market. And they don't want a whole hodgepodge of different leases. They want them all to look the same. So okay. oftentimes when someone comes in and, and they do want to do deal with your, uh, w with your deep wells, that they might offer you some more money just to get a better, better more modern standard okay. lease. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the one situation. The other situation is um, you may own your surface and not own your oil and gas. Oftentimes people, particularly back in the, the day when oil and gas in western Pennsylvania was hot, you know, Colonel Drake years, oh. they, would, they, would, they would sell, literally sell the farm surface yeah. and keep the oil and gas rights for their families. I see. So that's where people dealing with title had to go and certify who owns what. Wow. So just because you're walking on the top doesn't mean you're necessarily owning what's beneath it. Okay. Okay. So there were title issues. Generally, though, if you have the landman knocking on your door and smiling, they mm -hmm. have done that title work, and you probably, <laughs> okay. you probably have something. <laughs> Okay. Now the leases do say that you warrant that you own title to the uh, oil and gas when you sign the lease, uh, but generally you won't get paid until they can truly confirm that you do. Okay. Okay, but still you should have an attorney look at it. I've had I've had uh, people waive that provision ah. through addendum. Okay, that's that's the other trick when they start uh, negotiating with you. They want to have that standard lease. Right. Okay, so they can mark it and they can, you know, put it into their computers. They don't have to treat everybody right. differently. anything yeah. differently. And so uh, let's say they come to you and you have, you know, a hundred acre hunting camp, you know, someplace in northern central uh, Pennsylvania. And they say, gee, we'd like to get your oil and gas mm -hmm. rights. And you say, well, yeah, gee, but, you know, this is my hunting camp. Right. I don't want you to come in and cut down all my trees and then put a pad on there. Okay. You know, even though once the drilling operations are over, and nobody can see the size of this room, but it's, you know, maybe what, 100 square feet or something. When it's done, you know, that's that's the only invasion that you'll okay. have. Okay. But while they're there, it's a 24-hour going to mess up a couple of hunting seasons. Yeah, it's it's going to it's going to create new trails and all kinds of stuff. And you may say, "Listen, I'll give you my oil and gas rights, but I don't want you to drill on my property." Got it. Now you'll get less for those kind of leases, but at the same time, you can control what goes on on the surface. Okay. But to do that, they they sign what's called addendum. Okay, and the addendum is. Mm you know, the document that really sets forth what you want done specifically with your property I concerning see. your water, your trees. Wow. Your, you know, if you have a farm there, what they can do with, with in terms of the farm. Okay. You know, there are rules that um, prevent them from drilling within so many feet of buildings, so many feet of s streams and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But it's always better to get specific promises out of that. What about you get the situation where someone has, um, I, I actually have two questions on this. Number one, someone already has signed a lease. Mm -hmm. Is it too late? And are they continuously renewed so they'll never have another chance to get it right if they feel they got it wrong the first time by not talking to an attorney or whatever? Well. Most leases have a provision in there that says once they commence, there's a primary term uh, under the lease, and the primary term is pretty much when they do their investigation and decide if, in fact, uh, they're going to commence operations. Okay. 
if that primary term expires and if they don't have an extension period in that lease once it expires you can negotiate again with somebody else I see okay, okay. if they have commenced operations then you're in the secondary term and that's the term where you know they're going to be producing ultimately and if they produce then that lease is there forever until okay. they stop producing okay? okay once they stop producing then the lease will terminate after a certain period of time there's certain clauses in there that let's say you know they 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 stop producing because the prices are too low yeah right you know, do you want to yeah. do you want to say hey I, don't, I no longer want you there. I want to negotiate a good lease. Or are you recognizing that when their prices are low, your royalties are going to be lower too? Right. Yeah. Right, so right. those those are the things that you have to consider when you enter into those original leases. A lot of litigation has been going on over uh, people who had the old traditional leases, yeah. and then uh, you know they might not have been producing very much at all, and the next thing. Uh, you know, they're saying, well, the lease was terminated, and there's litigation over stuff like okay. that. Okay. All right. That's interesting. The other question I had is the situation on you have your land, and the ownership of the land is in whatever name it's in. It might be mm -hmm. husband and wife. Mm hmm. And then you have this oil situation come up, and they come out with a lease. This land, would you call them landmen? Yeah, landmen. They come out with a lease. You don't know any better, and you sign either as husband or husband and wife again. Yeah. Well, What's your take on all of that? Well, I, I mean, it seems natural uh, that that's what they want to do, but you know, the the notion there is now that becomes an asset of your estate. Until oil and gas is actually being produced, you really don't know how much it's worth. Right. Okay. So as we said in previous shows, when you have something that you don't know how much it's worth and you don't want it to be included in your estate, you find a way to get rid of it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and still control it, of course. Right. And so uh, typically what you can do is you can get a deed which severs, okay, the oil and gas estate from the surface estate. Okay. Okay, because let's say, for instance, you know, you own a farm, you're farming it, maybe one of your sons or daughters is farming it, and the other sons and daughters don't want to have anything to do with the farm. Yeah. Okay? Uh, if you leave the farm to the kid and you don't have severed those oil and gas rights, you just left a valuable asset to him exclusive of his or her brother and sister. Okay. So what we do is we sever the interest from the surface rights, you know, and retain certain rights uh, on the surface so that mm -hmm. you can still control the surface. Okay. And then you take it and put it into an entity that you can uh, share or trust that would benefit, you know, may maybe yourself if you need it or if you don't need it, you know, your children and your grandchildren. It, it can be a legacy. Right now they have not, they're still kind of guessing how long these wells will last. Okay. The, the initial you know, graphs were showing that they expected high production off uh, these fracking wells in the first couple years, and then they they thought it would drop off dramatically. Right, I saw that. And still produce, you know, maybe for the next 20, 40 years. Uh, they're finding from um, production uh, information that the uh, the gas actually is producing more in you know the 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 grid is i guess i should go this way on the camera the grid is not going down so steeply yeah. it's coming down a little bit slower that's so interesting you, it's producing a lot more gas than what you think and mm. the ne the next really interesting play is utica which is below uh marcellus and utica is what they call wet gas now, I know many of you have heard of the cracker plant that is going into Beaver County. Right. Uh, the purpose behind the cracker plant is that you take this wet gas and you sep separate minerals and elements from the wet gas yeah. that are just as valuable, if not more, than the gas itself, the natural gas itself. Okay. And so 
even even though the price or the BTU val, uh, dollar value uh, might be low on the gas, we may have production out of Utica. Now Utica is a lot shallower in Ohio than it is in western Pennsylvania, uh -huh. and I think that's why they they put the plant in Beaver. But the uh, mm. the bottom line is uh, we're still going to be seeing oil and gas production here for the rest of my lifetime. Good. Anyway. The other uh, side of that question I have for you is the ownership of the land, the surface land and the buildings and the farm or whatever, and then the ownership of the rights for the oil and the gas. If they're the same, do we run a risk, number one, of a slip and fall up on the land and everything's subject to the lawsuit because the names are the same, so they're all subject to that law lawsuit where should we make arrangements to have two different LLCs or whatever own those not individually and secondly one of the owners goes into a nursing home and we're subject to the spend on limits things right. like that and thirdly if the leases are already in place and they're in husband and wife let's say and so mm -hmm. are the deeds they're already in place mm -hmm. is it able to be changed or can you change the ownership on one of those leases let's say if after the fact you say I'd like to change the ownership from my husband and wife to an LLC or a company or something like that. Well, you'd, you'd have to get permission of the operator, but I can't see any reason why they would object, object to that Okay. if you wanted to transfer it out of your name, sure. So folks, I'm going to implore you to, if you have oil and gas leases in place, to consider some of these farther reaching risks and maybe contact Matt and explore if it's in your husband and wife name, like I'm saying, that might be exposed to risks that you didn't anticipate, maybe to explore, is it possible to further cement and protect those assets to some of those unforeseen either lawsuits or nursing homes or anything else that you uh, may not have anticipated when you were first so excited about signing that lease, yeah, right? That's correct. Matt, how do they get in touch with you once again? Uh, sure, you can call me at Bloomling and Gusky at 412-227-2500. Ask for Matt Carl. Matt, I appreciate once again you're coming in for all these shows and going through these different areas that you're helping people in and in Pittsburgh and otherwise. I wish we could keep having you on the show and you could keep <laughs> t telling us, but I don't want to take more than that amount of time. So everyone, it's been our privilege to have Matt Carl with us as a guest on these last four shows that we've had in a series. And again, thank you all for tuning in to All Things Financial. I'll be back again next week. You've been listening to All Things Financial with your friend with the answers to all financial matters, Jack Driscoll of Driscoll Insurance and Financial Services. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, a registered broker dealer and registered investment advisor and member FINRA and SIPC. Driscoll Insurance and Financial Services is not affiliated with Sage Point Financial Inc. or registered as a broker, dealer, or investment advisor. You can reach Driscoll Insurance and Financial Services Incorporated at 412 833 1500, and they are located at 2738 South. South Park Road, Bethel Park, Pennsylvania, 15102.